So in three, two. Good afternoon. I now call to order the November 15th, 2021 meeting of the Policy Review Committee of the Board of Education of Baltimore County. Today's Public Policy Review Committee meeting is being held virtually and broadcasted through Microsoft Teams Live on the BCPS website. In order to conduct this meeting by virtual means, all voting items this afternoon will be done by a roll call vote. Board members will say their names before making and seconding a motion as applicable, as well as when requesting discussion on an agenda item. Additionally, as a courtesy to the committee, I ask that you inform Ms. Clark or Ms. Howie if you must leave the call by using the Teams chat feature so that a quorum can be maintained. Ms. Clark, Ms. Clark, excuse me, please call the roll to determine the presence of a quorum of the committee. Yes, ma'am. Ms. Causey? Mr. Offerman? Present. Ms. Scott? Present. Mr. Thomas? Here. Thank you. Thank you. A quorum being present and we will begin. Ms. Clark, please call the roll of staff members participating in today's meeting. Ms. Anderson? Present. Ms. Casabone? Present. Ms. Ferguson? Present. Ms. Howie? Here. Ms. Peterson? Present. Dr. Sarchin? Present. Thank you. Thank you. PRC staff have asked that the new business items be presented out of order. With that, I will ask Ms. Anderson to begin with policy 4006. Thank you. Good afternoon, Chairwoman Scott, other members of the board, as well as BCPS members. I'm going to be presenting two policies today for human resources. The first policy is policy number 4006. Policy 406 is a longstanding rule that addresses various medical evaluations that employees may undergo at BCPS to include pre-employment physicals, Office of Transportation physicals, fitness for duty evaluations and independent medical evaluations. The purpose of this policy is to provide the standard and guidelines for employees and applicants as it relates to pre-employment and other job related medical examinations and evaluations. The policy presented for the committee's consideration contains the following revisions and one addition explaining how the rules and laws under which medical examinations and evaluations will be conducted Another addition is explaining that employees and applicants with contingent offers of employment will be informed of the process for medical evaluations. The revisions also add in related policies that may touch upon medical evaluations and those policies are as follows. Board of Education Policy 4100, Employee Conduct and Responsibilities. Board of Education Policy 4101, Drug-Free Workplace and Board of Education Policy 4202, Retirement. Staff are recommending the following changes to the policy. Include, one, include pre-employment medical evaluations in the policy statement, which is consistent with current business practice. Two, include a standard section, which is consistent with current editing and formatting guidelines. And three, conform with the Policy Review Committee's editing conventions. Thank you. And we also have Asada Peterson, um, our manager, Office of Employee Absence and Risk Management, um, available to answer any questions you may have with respect to the for policy 4006. Great, thank you for that. Do we have any questions from the um, committee for policy 4006? I'll just go around and call on each member's name. Um, I don't believe she's here, Ms. Causey. Yeah. OK, Mr. Offerman. Uh, the only one I have would probably would probably uh, relate to the rule, and that is uh, does do, does Baltimore County Public Schools pay for any of these things? No, the pre-employment verifications are actually paid for by the applicant. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank and Ms. Scott, Ms. Causey is on the call. Oh, I apologize. Okay, Mr. Offerman, do you have any additional questions? No. Okay, um, I'll go back, Ms. Calsey. Did you have any questions? 
Good afternoon. Thank you, Madam Chair, and um, thank you for this presentation. I did have a question related to um, page one, line 33, where it speaks to advising applicants with a contingent offer of employment of their responsibilities relating to required pre-employment employment physicals. Um, is it, would it be um, helpful perhaps to have that information made available earlier? Is it listed in job descriptions, for instance, when those positions are advertised? Yes, uh, I'm sorry, go ahead, Asada. Thank you for your question. Yes, as part of um, the contingent offer, applicants are informed of our pre-employment physical process. Um, and so they are ma made aware of it and the policy changes just um, consistent with what we're already doing as part of our practices. Thank you for that response. My question was really, would it be helpful to uh, make it known earlier in the process? Um, for instance, in the job description when it's being advertised that there are some um, requirements and responsibilities related to pre-employment. Yes, certainly. And I left that part out. Yes, in, in the job descriptions, um, the job descriptions indicate um, in, in that initial posting for the position that applicants are subject to pre-employment uh, physicals if they are selected for the next stage of the process. OK, great. Thank you. And um, just recently, there was an announcement by the superintendent and the county executive about the um, waiver of some costs of pre-employment. I don't have those in front of me, but were the were, and I know that happened just recently. And you all have been doing work on these policies for some number of weeks, maybe even months. Um, but is there uh, something related to that that would impact this policy? No, thank you for that question. That's an excellent question. No, it's not necessarily that it would impact this policy. Um, that is a, a temporary collaboration between BCPS and Baltimore County government um, to attract and retain our bus drivers and our bus attendants because right now we are experiencing a significant nationwide shortage um, and we are trying to retain these individuals to transport our students. Okay, thank you. And um, in terms of the uh, bus drivers, but also other positions, were the bargaining units given an opportunity to provide input to updates to policy 4006? That's a great question. Um, I can look into that and circle back to you. Okay, and I think Mr. Offerman had uh, said something about the superintendent's um, rule. Were there significant changes or just updates um, being considered for the update to the superintendent's role. I'm sorry, could you repeat that question, Ms. Causey? Were there significant updates being considered or just um, simple updates in the superintendent's rule that would accompany the update to policy 4006? Right, yes, thank you. No, there weren't really any substantive updates to that particular policy and rule. Um, it was really to bring that policy into conformance with the editing conventions outside of the other than the updates that we've already discussed, no oh, ma'am. Okay, thank you. That's all I have at this time. No problem. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Thomas. Do you have any questions? Uh, I do not, Ms. Scott. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. okay, so if there are no corrections, then policy 4006 is moved forward for first reading as presented. So we will Okay, so the next uh, policy it looks like is policy 4202 and that is retirement. And again, that's Ms. Anderson and Ms. Casabun. Yes. All right. Thank you, ma'am. Policy 4202 sets the guidelines for enrolling employees in a retirement system for which they qualify and for the continuation of health care benefits for board retirees. Eligibility to participate in one of the offered pension plans is dependent upon the requirements of the plan, the employee's job classification and date of employment. 
Retirees receiving a board approved retirement are eligible to enroll in retiree benefits if they were eligible for benefits at the time of retirement. The policy presented for the committee's consideration contains the following revisions. Align the policy statement to the board's goal to recruit and retain a skilled workforce. Correct the title of the Maryland State Retirement and Pension System in paragraph 1A. Add a new paragraph 1B to include the board's support of the continuation of health care benefits for retirees and includes a standard section which is consistent with current editing and formatting guidelines. The policy was also revised to conform with the policy review committee's editing conventions. While there weren't any substantive changes to the policy, staff are recommending that the policy be revised to comply with the policy reviews editing conventions. And I have Chris Cossabone, Employee Benefits Manager, available as well as myself to answer any questions. Thank you. Okay, and I will see if we have any questions. We'll go around first, Ms. Scalzi. Are you there? Do you have any questions? You're muted, Ms. Causey. Thank you. Thank you for that um, update to policy 4202. In the policy, which is very simple, um, it doesn't state who is responsible for, uh, provi for providing the retiree benefits. So it does have the name of the Maryland State Retirement and Pension System, um, and then this separate organization, which is the Baltimore County Employee Retirement System. And I'm asking that question based on um, feedback that we've received from some of our retired employees recently around changes to um, their health care benefits. And um, so my question is, how is uh, that information communicated to the employees and at what point? You're muted, Ms. Causey. Thank you. My touchpad's very sensitive. Um, where is it um, communicated to the employees? The um, the responsibility of the retirement plan being um, fulfilled by either the state or the county. So <clears throat> the, I think there's two different situations here. Number one, the pension plans are are through either the state or ERS. And then there are retiree benefits that are offered to Baltimore County Public School retirees. And there is a portion paid by the board depending on their years of service. Um, so I'm not, I, th I think you're asking, and, and correct me if I'm wrong, where, whose responsibility is to communicate with the retiree benefits and who plans those benefits? Is that what you're asking? Yes, thank you for yeah. clarifying my question for sure. me. That's sure. great. So we at, um, at Baltimore County Public Schools, we more or less piggyback off of the county benefits. So what um, the county, Baltimore County, offers to their retirees this year, our offerings mirror what they offer. We communicate with the county. They um, This year we're using Labor First, the retiree advocacy firm, to help with the Medicare eligible people. And we work with the county and with Labor First to communicate those changes. OK, so at, at some point the retirees are made aware of that. Process correct. OK, and then if changes are made to the benefits, they are actually made by the county or. By the state. Well, they're made Baltimore County Public Schools, the benefits of the board share is paid through Baltimore County Public Schools and we make the changes, but we have traditionally followed suit with what the county offers. OK, because we heard some feedback from retirees that they were unhappy with. Um, the situation with Labor First currently um, and concerns about that, and it did not seem that the Board of Education um, was provided information and we had no approval process that we were involved in, so how how are the changes actually made for the retirees? So if I may, just for a, a little bit more clarification, uh, Ms. Causey, if I could please jump in, colleagues. Um, Ms. Causey, you're talking about 
when you say benefits, when you say benefits to the Office of Benefits, uh, they may be thinking about health benefits. Uh, but given that there are two different retirement systems, there is a difference between the pension a person receives and the health benefits coverage that a person receives. So our employees receive a pension from one of two different retirement systems, either the Maryland state system or the Baltimore County ERS. That's just the pension payment. And obviously for both, it's based on years of service. And as this policy addresses, eligibility as determined by that retirement system. And then the, the questions that I think you're asking and my colleagues are answering has to do with the, I'm sorry, the, uh, the health benefits and the coverage for health benefits. So when Ms. Kossaboon indicated to you that uh, it was the county government that we piggyback on the county government. It was for the health benefits, not for pension, because we're talking two different things. And I just wanted to make sure that was clear. Yes, thank you. So on page one, line 17, there's a statement that says the board supports the continuation of health care benefits for retirees as an incentive for recruitment and retention of employees and to recognize employees for their years of service to the Baltimore County Public Schools. So in that statement saying that we support the continuation of health care benefits, um, that's, a me that's a message from the Board of Education to the county, um, but we don't have, the board does not have an approval role in that, in the health benefit. Is that a fair statement? That is my understanding, correct. Okay, thank you. Um, that's all I have right now, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Offerman. Not at this time. Okay, Mr. Thomas. Thank you. Uh, so just for my clarification, uh, what is it? Well, on page one, line 13, where it says Maryland State Retirement and Pension System, and then it says, or the Baltimore County's Employees Retirement System. So we got rid of the word and. And was that just a grammatical error? Because you, could, you can't have both the Maryland State Retirement and Pension System and the Baltimore County Employees Retirement System. You have to choose either. No. So, <laughs> No, no. not making a choice. It's depending on what type of position you have with BCPS that determines okay. which plan you're eligible for. So yes, that removing that word and it was uh, just an, a, a, a grammar issue. Okay, and thank you for clarifying about the choice. I don't know much <laughs> about retirement plans, uh, but thank you. And those are all my questions. Okay. Thank you, and I do not have any questions. I appreciate you clarifying the difference between health benefits and pension though. Um, so if there are no um, objections to the policy as, as presented or amendments to the policy, then policy 4202 is moved forward for first reading as presented. Thank now you. we will go forward to policy 5100 compulsory attendance and presenting is Dr. Zarchin and Ms. Ferguson. Excuse me, Madam Chair, members of yes. the committee prior to moving forward with the next policy, uh, could Ms. Anderson um, and her staff please be excused? Yes, and thank you very much for attending. Thank you. Good afternoon. Policy 5100 being reviewed today represents board policy on students compulsory attendance as required by COMAR. At this time, I would like to welcome Kim Ferguson to share background and proposed changes. Ms. Ferguson. Good afternoon, everyone. Good afternoon, um, Chairman Scott, board members and BCPS staff. Um, as Dr. Zarchin said, we're bringing before you policy 5100. Um, the policy presented for committee's consideration contains the following revisions. 
um, in paragraph A, clarifying the compulsory attendance law as, as required by state law and regulation. In paragraph uh, 1B, tie the policy, we're tying the policy to the board's goals by linking attendance to student academic achievement. We are also including the definition of parent and clarifying the update and updating the standard section to be consistent with the language in the state law and regulation. The policy has also been revised to conform with policy review committees editing conventions. Um, these, this particular policy is related to um, policy 5000 students, uh, policy 5110 admission, policy 5120 attendance and excuses, policy 5130 withdrawal from school prior to graduation, policy 5140 assignment and or special permission transfer and policy 5150 resident and non-resident student eligibility. Great, thank you. We'll go around and start with questions. Ms. Causey. Good afternoon. Thank you, Ms. Ferguson for um, that presentation. For policy 5100, um, I appreciate all of the changes that were made. Um, and I'm curious why on page one, line uh, nine and 10, that the words, um, there are several words, but um, were removed, um, but that indicate that the student be enrolled in and attend school mm -hmm. each day that school is in session. Do you know why it was that? What was the rationale for removing that? So um, that information is actually. Um, let's see. So that that information is not necessarily in Comar. What we did was we um, clarified it in the standards. OK, Ms. Causey, do you have another question? Um, yes, and I and I see where it's in the standards except for excuses, but it doesn't really indicate that every day. Um, but if it's it, I understand your rationale. Um, also in um, paragraph B on line 16, the words were removed. Um, <clears throat> become responsible, lifelong learners and productive citizens. And I wonder what was the rationale for removing that? So we wanted to add the information. Um, we replaced that text with to be college or college or career ready and prepared to be glo globally competitive citizens. Um, that's the language that um, we wanted to align that language uh, with our, um, our board goals. OK, and we <clears throat> we've also talked um, about lifelong learners. Um, and you know, responsible and productive citizens. So um, I'll just think about that. Maybe I'll uh, make a motion later to add that back. And my last question was um, under on page two, paragraph four. Um, it removes the statement: the superintendent shall establish procedures to ensure that students are enrolled in and regularly attending school in accordance with Maryland law or regulation. Um, and I'm just curious what the rationale was for removing that. For implementation. Yes. OK, so. Let's see. So that language is consistent right. with your yes. standards, right? Sorry, could you say that again, please? Sure, that language is consistent with PRC standards and editing conventions. That's the standard implementation language. Okay, so it wasn't added because it's already assumed or it's already there. So, so could we consider to add back that statement um, as a standard labeled letter E? So 
So, ma'am, are you asking that um, what was formerly 3A now be uh, the new 3B? I mean, 3E, excuse me. Ms. Cosy. Is, is she here? Is she there? Yeah, she's muted. Is that, um, yes, yes, that, that was what I was asking, Ms. Howie? Thank you. Okay. So she wants, um, if I could understand, um, implementation where it's A, where it was removed because it's already the standard language to be added back in as 3E. Is that correct? That's what I understood. So the language that is currently uh, being recommended for deletion that is uh, represented in lines 13 through 15, that that language be added um, under a new section E. Okay, and the reason you said it was taken out was, again, why? Because maybe perhaps I'm not clear on why it was taken out. So one reason, as I indicated, is that the standard language the board directs the superintendent to implement. Uh, that is your standard language, uh, and that is in the PRC editing conventions. The other reason is because there is an attendance policy, and when staff looked at this, this looked more like attendance language. So this language uh, was placed in, or similar language was placed in the attendance policy. So it was deemed to be redundant? Yes, ma'am. Okay. So clearly it's the board's policy. It's the board's decision. Okay. All right. Uh, Ms. Clancy, did you have any other questions before we move along? I was just going to um, make a quick motion. I put in the chat, I move we include language on page two, line 13 to 15 under a new section 3E. Is there a second? Okay, so hearing no second, um, we will uh, go to the next uh, committee member for questions. Uh, thank Mr. You. Offerman, thank you. Mr. Offerman, did you have any questions or comments? Uh, the only concern I have or question is, and I'm looking at uh, lines uh, lines uh, 27 through 30, essentially. Uh, I assume this section uh, covers all the students who are the students who are enrolled in either private schools or some kind of homeschooling. And this is probably much more, much more of an operations question. I don't, I'm not concerned if you're answer today, but I'd like to hear some kind of answer as to how, how or who is, is, uh, is responsible for uh, uh, checking on, on these students are receiving some kind of regular instruction program as defined in, in the, uh, in the policy. And that would be Dr. Zarchin's division, so he could speak to residency officers if that's what the uh, committee is asking right now. Uh, yes, that, that 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 would help me. Thank you. Can I can I get clarification? Are you talking about the private school students? Well, uh, uh, the, my what, what what it basically boils down to it, it what 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 prevents a student from just slipping through completely? Who doesn't enroll in private school and isn't in a, 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 a verified homeschool program? I, I, you know, this is probably very rare, but you know, I'm, I'm just concerned that that we may have kids who, who, uh, who might actually, as they always say, slip, slip through the crack. And I, I just want to make sure that that if if we are responsible for making sure that the, that that all those kids are are getting a are getting a, a formal education, I, I just want to make sure we have a process to to find or determine if if uh, if some children are uh, are not receiving that. Hope that makes sense. It does, and I think we can get details for you as as records are transferred. If there's a problem with the student starting at another school, for example, a private school, typically the the sending school would get information back. Uh, once again, as far as details, I would have to get that from residency or pupil personnel workers. And that will be fine, okay? Cause this is not really, uh, this is not really uh, a question of, about the policy. Uh, it's it it's uh, it, it's certainly it's certainly one more process. So thank, thank you. you. 
Thank you, Mr. Thomas. Thank you, Ms. Scott. Um, so I I just on page one line twenty, uh, we define the word parent, and I'm just wondering if maybe there was a more inclusive word that we could be using besides parent right there. I know we define parent as the biological or adoptive parent, legal guardian, or person acting in the presence of the parent or guardian, but it, is there another word? I, I was trying to do some quick research earlier today, trying to find another word that maybe could substitute the word parent, just because it may not always seem like the most inclusive word. And I was reading a few articles about how it really isn't inclusive for people that don't have uh, two parents or, or parents in, in a household. So I was wondering if there were maybe any other words that were uh, considered besides just the word parent. I don't know about other words that were considered, but the definition uh, we tried to keep as broad as possible. Um, Ms. Ferguson, any any discussion about the, the term? No, no discussion about the term. I mean, certainly something we can consider. Um, I mean, the only other word that comes to mind is guardian at this time, um, but that's explained in the definition. Thank you, Ms. Ferguson. Um, and I, I kind of I think that guardian would maybe be a better word to apply there, because if we are, for example, if we're referring to everyone as man, if we're using man as a broad term, and then we define man as any person who is someone, 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 or, you know, if, we're, if we define the word man as a, like, in an older older uh, text, if we use the word man, it's, it's just outdated. And so I think that maybe we should replace the word parent and uh, go through our policies system-wide to see if there is a stronger word. And so, um, if do you so, believe guardian would be an appropriate word, Miss Howie? So, what I would like the opportunity to do is to go back to the regulation. I believe that this language mirrors what's in state regulation. And as to a stronger word, I mean, families do look different. Uh, depending on you know what your whatever your social location is, but the question is whether or not what some people think of parents is defined differently within your your family structure, whatever that structure is. But the law may still and the statute may still call it parent. Um, and if you're acting as if you are parent, then we will treat you as if you are that individual's parent whether or not you be the guardian, whether or not you've adopted the individual, whether or not uh, that student is living with um, an individual. Uh, so I, I'm not sure stronger word. I understand your desire for inclusivity, um, but I wouldn't want to, um, to exclude as we're trying to include. Okay. Um, and I think I could ask Ms. Causey to expand on her comment in the chat, Ms. Scott. Sure, but I would like to speak to the yeah. um, parent. Um, as far as I don't think there is a stronger word than parent. I think parent is the strongest word as a parent. That's um, I think how you should refer. Um, and also I think that the definition does say uh, a biological or adoptive parent, legal guardian, or person acting in the op absence of the parent or the guardian. So I, I, I would actually disagree with that. I don't think that it should be watered down to, to something sort of abstract or esoteric. Um, it's a person who's acting as the parent of said student or child and that definition is 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 clearly written written in there so um i think that guardian i think that you said miss causey you you would like for miss causey to explain to you the definition of a guardian or um she said there was prior discussion with miss pastor including guardian with parent i would assume that would be in um curriculum um, but I don't want to move too much away from the policy and start going into an esoteric theoretical discussion um, about something that happened in another committee. I think we need to be clear on the language and the terminology and how it applies to the policy before us. And uh, Ms. Clark did provide to me the specific Comar reference, so I've put that in the chat. 
Um, that is where parent is defined, uh, and we've lifted that definition and placed it here. Again, if there is another um, word that the committee has in mind other than guardian, um, please let us know. Okay. Um, it looked like there was a question from Ms. Jose. Oh, I didn't know we had another board member. Um, are there any additional board members joining us? I should have asked that. No, OK, Ms. Jose, are you there? Yes, thank you, Ms. Okay, Grant. Um, just quick clarification, since now we have the virtual learning program, uh, is there, would we need clarification to include that into attendance as well? Or would that same guidelines have for VLP program? It would be the same guidelines. OK, thank you. Thank you. Are there any additional comments or questions? There are comments in the chat from Ms. Causey now. Ms. Causey, yes, Ms. Causey, you may respond to Mr. Thomas. Thank you. Um, thank you, Mr. Thomas, for your discussion. Um, it did uh, prompt me to recall that Ms. Pasture um, in conversations um, had said that for inclusivity and um, to really uh, bolster um, those individuals who do become guardians, uh, either legally or through um, assumption of the care of a child that otherwise does not have an available parent, um, that she would uh, use parent and guardian to be more inclusive. So um, to Ms. Scott's point, there's parents that clearly uh, would like their role recognized as parents, um, but also to be inclusive, um, to use the word guardian, it might not be um, too prohibitive to add that as well. So I would just make that, I just wanted to make that um, comment to you. Thank you. Um, but as is Ms. Pastor is not here, I don't presume to speak on what she meant when she said that because I do not recall um, that statement that was made. It uh, looks like there's another comment from Mr. Thomas. Please go ahead. Uh, thank you, Ms. Causey. And uh, Ms. Howie, do you think it'll be appropriate to maybe add the definition of a guardian as well um, to have another definition? And then when parent is referenced uh, later on, for example, on page two, line one, where it says each parent or person who has legal custody or care and control of a child who is legally mandated age to attend school shall ensure that the child attends school or receives instructional instruction as required by law. Maybe instead of stating who has legal custody or care and control of a child, it, we could define the word guardian above and then say parent or guardian. So what you're doing is covered by the definition. And if the individual doesn't have legal control, at least in that context, then we can't force the individual to make sure that the student gets to school. So it may be um, that, well, let me, let me ask it this way. If the committee could please explain what the goal is. What is it that the committee believes is What I believe necessary. what members are are saying is that um, what well I'm not members what Mr. Thomas and Ms. Causey are, um, are are saying is that uh, parent excludes um, some other roles of I guess caretakers or people who are taking care of children. Um, I don't believe it does because I believe the definition there says that a parent also includes a guardian. So going forward, parent, the way I view it, is being used as an acronym for guardian, caretaker, person legally responsible for said student. So I think it it's redundant, but that is what I think is the goal that's attempting to be accomplished. So let me just give an example. Um, language some of the language that was taken out informs excuse me some of the language that was taken out refers to informal kinship care individuals who have informal kinship care are not legal guardians necessarily they have not gone through the process 
let's say mom or dad has been deployed um, and grandma, aunt, someone else steps in to assist, that person has taken on a responsibility but has not gone through any sort of legal process. And we respect the fact that different families have different um, different sorts of res access, access to resources. So they may not be able to afford to get any sort of temporary custody, formal temporary custody. Uh, therefore, what we were hoping to do by, by defining guardian as parent uh, was to expand the universe of possibilities and not constrict it. So if I understand what the committee members are concerned about, it's that someone sees the word, looks at it negatively, or as Mr. Thomas says, looks at it as um, something that is archaic. Uh, but what we were trying to do is just the opposite. And again, to expand it, number one, to make sure it's consistent with the regulation. And number two, uh, to make sure that if you are in one of those other roles, we're still going to consider you a parent. So, I, I, so my, I'm um, understanding what the committee's desire is. So my, the way I'm reading it, you've done that, but it sounds like that's not what is being translated um, to um, committee member. Well, the individual committee members. Looks like there's a comment for Mr. Thomas. Please go ahead. Thank you, uh, Ms. Howie. Thank you for explaining that. Uh, it. It helps with kind of my, my interpretation of the word parent and that that was what I, what I believed it was that if someone viewed the word parent and they saw it negatively, they saw it as something that was um, exclusive because of maybe how society views the word parent or different individuals view the word parent. But I appreciate you going into the uh, background as to why that was chosen and how it does create a more inclusive uh, broad definition of the term. Um, so thank you and uh, I appreciate being able to have this dialogue about the definition of parent. Thank you. Surely. And I'm not sure if Dr. Zarchin or Ms. Ferguson has anything to add. No, I think um, I, I'm good. So I just want to be clear. So we're 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 OK moving forward with the term parent, correct? With the definition that follows. Great. Thank you. Thank you. Any additional questions? OK. All right, so then. If there are no objections to the policy as presented or amendments, policy 5100 is moved forward for first reading as presented. Next is the Public Works Operational Efficiency Review report and policy recommendations. And for that, we call on Ms. Howie. Thank you, Madam Chair. Actually, the next item is board policy 8350. And I would ask that Dr. Zarchan and Ms. Ferguson be excused. Oh, I apologize. Yes, they may. Um, I don't have 8350 on my script. I apologize. But it is on. It is on the agenda. OK. So I do apologize that that was excluded from your script. 8350. OK. Yes, ma'am. Board Council. OK. OK, yes. Um, and um, are you presenting on that? Yes, ma'am. OK, yes, please proceed. Thank you. Thank you, um, Madam Chair, members of the committee. Uh, policy 8350 pursuant to policy 8130 was scheduled for review during the 21-22 school year. The policy addresses board counsel and the role of board counsel. As you're aware, recently, uh, the county attorney, or in, since this policy was last revised, I should say, the county attorney clarified uh, his role with respect to the selection of the board's counsel. So we've included in the legal references the county charter. 
You should also uh, be aware, I'll also point out to you that we are recommending that uh, the language that is in the board's handbook concerning the role as parliamentarian to the board during board's meetings, the board's meetings, that that be included in the policy as well. That is new language. There is nothing else that has changed in uh, the policy. Um, as indicated to you at your last meeting, we are including in our policy analyses references to the public works report. So I'd point out to you that uh, on page 63, recommendation 17, um, in addition to recommending a civility policy, public works recommended that your board council um, be a professional registered parliamentarian and have that credential. And um, I know that that was that there were certain membership requirements that were in the last um, RFP uh, that was issued by county government, not aware of whether or not there were credentialing requirements. But just so the board is aware, um, the National Association of Parliamentarians has changed uh, some of its credentialing requirements. In order to be a PRP, one must first be an RP. It now takes approximately six to nine months to earn the RP credential. And then it is now required that an individual hold the RP credential for at least one year before at least attempting to obtain the PRP credential. So we have not included that part of the requirement in your board policy. And with that, I'm happy to answer any questions. Oh, thank you for that, Ms. Howie. Um, uh, yes, I will go around <laughs> to see if there's any questions. Um, Ms. Causey. Thank you for that um, explanation, Ms. Howie. Um, so, Given the information you shared about the RP credential requiring six months of training. At least <clears throat> testing actually. Six months of testing. Mm -hmm. Okay. And then holding that for one year um, before attempting to become the P a PRP credential. Correct. What um, designation is include was included in the board's prior um, Requests. I don't know that a designation was included. Uh, I believe that there was a request for membership in either the um, in either AIP or NAP. I don't know if there was a request for a specific credential. I, I'm I'm sorry, I'm just not familiar. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. um, so I saw that recommendation from the Public Works, and I. Um, thought and actually maybe Madam Chair, um, you're aware that that was requested in the um, procurement through the county, a professional registered parliamentarian, or was it just a member of? Are you asking me a question? Yes, if you know. state the question, I didn't understand what you were saying. Thank you. Recently, the uh, county government um, executed procurement for the board's council according to the current mm -hmm. code. And so in that uh, procurement, did the board uh, request a professional registered parliamentarian? The, um, the board uh, the board is requesting that whoever's our legal counsel be a registered parliamentarian. You were part of what we wanted to discuss as far as what we wanted in our legal counsel. So so my, I guess my question is, should we include that in the policy 8350 or Ms. Howie, would that be um, better to include in the board handbook? As far as our lawyer being um, a registered parliamentarian? Yes. It seems to me you need to include it in both places, um, mm -hmm. but if the 
RFP did not indicate a particular credential uh, when you issued it. And again, my recollection, my recollection is sketchy. When I drafted this, I recall that I reviewed the uh, RFP and do not recall that there was a specific credential required. And that is that I dropped in a footnote. Uh, but if you're now requiring a credential when one was not required before and uh, you're going through the RFP process, uh, that does not seem to be terribly fair to an individual if you're now asking for an additional requirement. Could there be language that in future procurements, so in terms of essentially grandfathering in and whatever is, there's another term, right? Um, grandmothering in um, a prior appointment. So if it's aspirational that future um, board council um, shall obtain or seek or have uh, a credential recognized by one of the national accrediting um, organizations. Again, I'm trying to trying to look at this as well from the the point of view of a relatively new process for the board in selecting board council. So to select board council on one hand and have a policy on the other that does not necessarily mesh does not uh, it doesn't, doesn't seem to be fair yeah. to someone who is is in good faith um, attending to the board's needs thank you and um thank you for that conversation and i'm um i'm going to shift to another one that you that you reference and that's also um very important in the policy analysis on page two and page three you um uh, spell out five different counties and their um rel some relevant phrases from their policies yes, and it, correct me if i'm wrong but all five of those um have statements where the county board of education um is authorized and empowered to retain the services of an attorney so in legal matters for 104 the education article has four very interesting words except in baltimore county and that's where that's the the statute that authorizes local boards to obtain counsel and those four words uh are addressed and have been addressed by our county attorney and uh refer back to the county code so, so it's all there is not um, there is no longer there used to be Baltimore City used to have a similar requirement does not any longer uh, but there is no direct parallel uh, of the other counties and the city of Baltimore. So if Balt if the Board of Education wow. of Baltimore County wanted to um, be in alignment with other school districts then uh, what would be necessary to petition the legislature to take out those four words mm -hmm. from yes. the state law? Yeah. Yes, it would come out of the education article. Yes, ma'am. OK, so. Um, I guess would that be um, a motion that the policy review committee could make and consider yeah. <laughs> to submit to the full board to request? It would probably go through the legislative committee to um, request something like that. I mean, we're looking at the policy as it is and asking for changes to or anything or additions to what's here. We're now pivoting off into something else. That would be more for like um, the legislative committee um, if it would be going to Annapolis or, or drafting something or, um, but I, I don't see that that falls under the purview of PRC. Okay, it's it's just that I'm noting that here in the pol in the policy analysis. Um, so, because that does make a difference in what our board is able to do 
um, relative to other school districts in the county. Um, but so moving along, um, mm -hmm. the other issue where I was um, wondering if there should be any specification is um, how distinguish how to distinguish um, the legal fees are paid in the other um, county policies. They have uh, specific statements that said if so exercise funds for legal fees shall be included in the annual budget. Mm -hmm. um, so Ms. Howie, is that something that would be reasonable to include in this policy? It's certainly up to the board. It's within your discretion. This is your policy about your council. OK. Um, that doesn't seem, and, and correct me if I'm wrong, Ms. Howie, that doesn't seem uh, 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 appropriate. This is about our, our council and the recommendations from Public Works and specific things that we're looking for in um, our council. As far as payment or money that goes to paying, that seems like that would be that would go into perhaps another policy. Is there a policy? I, I just it just sounds like I'm, I'm I'm just concerned about policies being used as like the kitchen sink just to throw everything and anything in. Um, I, I just want to make sure that, that that we're being streamlined and consistent. If you could weigh in on that, please. Sure. So again, it's your policy. And if you want to include in your policy a statement about qualifications, which you've we, we lifted uh, the statement concerning the uh, the council being your parliamentarian, that is something that is now in your handbook and we've simply mirrored it here in your policy. So if you want to include something about payment, then these are your internal board policies. This is how you do business. That is completely up to the board. And is there another policy though that that should be added to? It just seems concerning that it would be added to this one. I don't, I'm just confused. I mean, I don't. I don't want to create. I know you know it's up to the board, but I don't want to create kitchen sink policies where we're just throwing everything in there. I want the I want the policies to be relevant. So that's why I ask um, the. Um, the questions because I can throw I have a whole bunch of ideas I can throw in there, you know, but I, I want to make sure that it's appropriate. So uh, again, I would I would say that it's the committee's decision to recommend to the board what you believe to be the best way to operate as an entity because the internal board policies, the 8000 series, unlike um, other series, the 8000 series only has one rule because there's only one place and that's 8130 where the superintendent has something to do. But the 8000 series operate a little bit differently than the other eight series, zero through uh, seven through eight that through 7000, excuse me. So if you want to make this more operational, that's not inappropriate because these are operational with respect to the board, which is why it's operations. Operations of the board. So it, it seems to me that um, the the tension that exists and the the question that exists is exactly what do you want the policy to direct the board to do, and how do you want the board to be held accountable? based on the policy that you have written yourselves or you've approved yourselves for your own operations. And that's that's not a question staff should answer. Got it. OK. Um, I want to make sure we get everyone's questions. Uh, Mr. Offerman, did you have a question or comment? No. OK, uh, Mr. Thomas. Uh. No questions, thank you. Okay. Um, I actually have a question or a comment, um, Ms. Um, Howie. I would ask, um, would this be the appropriate place to put in? Um, I think that all board members should take a MABE um, training. I know it says Board of MABE, uh, Maryland Association of Board of Education's team building workshops, but a basic rudimentary elementary 
training on parliamentary procedure. Would this be the appropriate place to add that? Mr. I do not think Scott? so, ma'am. I'm sorry, uh, Mr. Hoffman, I spoke over you. Okay, I'm sorry, Ms. Scott, I don't think, and I've certainly deferred, I, I certainly deferred to Ms. Howie, but uh, I'd like to stay focused on this policy as it is. And I think adding that kind of requirement is, is uh, would, uh, it, it doesn't fit in this policy. It, much, it, it perhaps it belongs in the in the uh, in the uh, board handbook, or perhaps oh. belongs in somewhere else. So I'd uh, I'd like to move forward if possible. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Offerman. Sorry, Miss Howie. Uh, um, did you have? Um... I was going to agree. This is a, this is about board council. Uh, Got it about board member training and the specific recommendations in uh, public works had to do with requiring that your uh, board council have a PRP. Uh, and there was also uh, a question in the um, in the recommendations about whether or not uh, the review of this policy was passed due, but it is not. Got it. Thank you. All right, are there any other questions or comments? Ms. Causey has a um, chat. Ms. Causey, you have a motion? Yes, thank you, Madam Chair. I move that policy 8350 be amended to include paragraph 1C, funds for legal fees shall be included in the annual budget. Is there a second? Second, Thomas. Okay. It looks like you have a question, Mr. Thomas. Oh, the question does not apply to this motion. It was uh, okay. intended for the motion, but thank you. Any questions in regards to the motion? None? Okay, it's been, um, so Ms. Causey moved that policy 8350 be amended to include paragraph 1C, funds for legal services shall be included in the annual budget. All right. Um, and I believe it's Ms. Fast. If we could take a roll call vote, please. Yes, Ms. Causey. Yes. Mr. Offerman. No. Ms. Mr. Thomas. Yes. Ms. Scott. No. It's okay. lost, man. All right. Thank you. Okay. Do we have any other questions or um, discussion in regards to to this policy? Uh, 8350, you're right, it is in the um, agenda. It's not in my script though. <laughs> yes, I have a question, Ms. Scott. Yes. Uh, so in, in the way that the public works recommendation is written, it says the board legal counsel should be required to earn a, a professional registered parliamentarian credential. So would it be unfair if we just restated that should be required to earn a professional registered parliamentarian credential instead of saying that they must have one? So that can mean that the parliamentarian, if we the next if the board establishes a new parliamentarian that they would just be required to earn one. But do you think that that would be unfair? So, so you're, go ahead, Howie. So assuming for the sake of argument that um, when the board passes this policy 8350 as amended, the board includes the language that legal counsel should be required to obtain um, a PRP credential. Mm, when? And let, I mean, should be, again, it's not a mandate necessarily. It's a very strong suggestion um, assume also for the sake of argument that legal counsel looks at this and says, I should be, but I don't have to be. So you, you've included um, language in your, um, in your policy that you choose in a way not to enforce uh, because it does not look as if it is or could be uh, argued that it's not a mandate. It's just a very strong suggestion. So that goes back to what the board's goal is and what the board's goals are. Um, one of the things that, uh, the, that the National Association is now stressing with both PRPs, which wasn't stressed back in the day when I was a PRP, is that, um, that or an RP rather, 
that RPs uh, be conversant in teaching about parliamentary procedure, in doing training. Uh, that's part of the new uh, credentialing process for RPs uh, when it was a credentialing process for me as a PRP. So uh, there is a very strong push to make sure that um, that bodies understand Robert's rules, that these are not secrets. <laughs> it's the more and the better um, equipped you are as as members of the board, the better you're going to be able to handle meetings. So you would want, it seems to me, certain skill sets. Um, and again, Public Works is recommending a specific credential, but if you put the language in, what is it that you're actually asking of your uh, board council? That's what I would ask you. Uh, if you're asking or if you're demanding that future board council have uh, this credential, then, and Ms. Causey had referred to this earlier in the discussion, uh, whether or not there would be some way to craft it so that it could be said that, you know, from whatever date, all board, all council appointed after fill in the blank um, must have a credential uh, of professional registered parliamentarian. But again, it depends on what it is you're looking for right. in the meeting professional that you're choosing. Okay, and so just from my understanding the process for selecting our parliamentarian is that a yearly review to determine who the parliamentarian will be or what is the process for that like and i know this is really good the policy but i think it'll help me understand yeah now the, the parliamentarian the board parliamentarian is the board council okay so whoever okay, board so then, is, that's your your meeting parliamentarian. Okay, and so basically, it's just whether or not the board wants us wants the board council to have a requirement to be a PR to wants the board council to have the requirement of PRP, mm -hmm. and if not, then if we were to amend the policy and adopt and a, the board adopted the policy, then board council would be required to have mm -hmm. a PRP credential because the the recommendation says should be required and. That sounds like a very strong requirement or very strong recommendation. It doesn't say gotcha. must. Okay. Must me is I have to do it. You should be required. Okay. Okay. And from my understanding, Ms. Howe, you are a board counsel, correct? I am not board counsel. Okay. That's Mr. Of your meetings. Mr. Bersades. Mr. Bersades. <laughs> I'm board counsel for the purpose and as general counsel, for purpose of litigation. I represent the board qua system. Okay, and then what do you think would be an appropriate year to maybe put this in place if we were to say by, by a certain year? Or would that be up to the board PRC committee? I think that's, again, it's what is the expectation that the committee and the board has of parliamentary expertise that your board council has? That's, that's really a question that, I mean, I happen to know the kind of expertise that uh, a PRP or an RP should have, but I don't know if that's what the board wants. It's certainly what uh, one of the things that the public works recommend. Okay. Thank you so much. Sure. Okay, thank you. Are there any additional questions or comments? I do have another question. Yes, Mr. Thomas. This is Mr. Offerman. I'm calling orders of the day. Okay, Mr. Offerman has called for the orders of the day and it is 5.30, so that means we move along to the next. And um, so when you call for orders of the day, then we move along to the agenda. And so basically um, the next item on the agenda is, I have it as the Public Works Operational Efficiency Review Report and Policy Recommendations. Ms. Causey has a, has a comment. Well, when you call orders of the day, we have to move forward to the next order of the day. So her comment would need to be um, related to the next agenda item. So does the committee wish me to proceed? Yes, orders of the day were called, and um, as I understand it, that's not a negotiable um, motion. It's not debatable. That's yeah, it's not debatable. So we're moving forward to the next order 
of the day, which is the um, the Public Works Operational Efficiency Review Report and Policy Recommendations. Excuse me, Madam Chair, I was waiting to be recognized to speak. The orders of the day were called before you were recognized. Um, I understand that uh, Mr. Offerman spoke before I was recognized, but yes. I had put in the chat a motion before he made the orders of the day. So I have a point of inquiry as to whether my motion uh, preceded his orders of the day. And so could it be processed? Well, the, the motion was not on the floor. So um, if I understand, it cannot be processed because the orders of the day were called. The motion was not moved and seconded and it was not on the floor before the assembly and the orders of the day were called and it's not debatable. So we have to go forward with what is next on the agenda. As I understand it, Ms. Howie, if you could please weigh in. So members seeking recognition, it would depend on whether or not the recognition was sought before orders of the day were called. Um, I see that 5.39 p.m. is when Ms. Causey placed her comments in the chat. I do not know at what time orders of the day were called. I was not looking at the, um, the timer at that point. I was not either. Um, I heard orders of the day. Um, yes, and I, it was at the same time. I have it at 5.39 p.m. So they were both at the same time? Yes. Thank you. I have an additional question so related to this point of inquiry. Me. Um, so if we're inquiring, if orders of the day were called at the same time a motion was put in the chat and the orders of the day were recognized and it's not debatable, which I feel we are now debating, um, is it appropriate to move on with the next agenda item? That's the decision of the chair. The chair could also present it to the assembly for the assembly to decide uh, which, the, which one the, the assembly would prefer. We're in a small assembly, so the rules are relaxed. Okay, so we're in a small assembly. Um, it would be decided, do we want to process the motion or do we want to go through with orders of the day? Is that correct? Yes. Okay. Um, this looks like a complex motion that was sent over at the last minute. I'm not quite sure what it is. Um, as a chair, I would say that we should probably move on with orders of the day so that we can process our meeting, um, but I don't want to just do that. So um, if we could take a roll call vote, I guess, um, Ms. Fass, um, if we would process Ms. Causey's motion since it came through at the same time that the orders of the day were called. I have a question. Has, has, ha, ha, has anyone seconded the motion? No, it has not been seconded. It has not even well, been um, brought to the floor. It's vote. not even on the floor. So the motion so has one, not. One mm -hmm. of the things you can do, members of the committee, is uh, even though a call for orders of the day is obviously the superior motion, you can certainly postpone further discussion of 8350. I see Mr. Offerman has a hard stop at um, six o'clock. So that way um, discussion can continue about the role you would like your board council to take. I think this is a significant policy for the board's own, own operations, uh, the committee needs to spend the time to discuss it. It's not something you would want to rush. Then I, I would agree with that. Then I move to postpone uh, discussion on 8350, um, which would come up at our next PRC meeting. Sorry. Is there a second? Sorry. There is a second. Um, if we could do a roll call vote, please. I have a point of discussion. We're in the middle of a vote. Ms. Fass, if we could do a no, roll call vote, I have a point please. of discussion about this vote. Um, we're in the middle of a vote, Ms. Causey. We're not in the middle because- We are I in the middle. We're taking a, a, a vote now. So um, Ms. Fass, if we could do a roll call vote so that we could okay. move this meeting along. Madam Chair, I had my hand raised to ask a question about this vote and uh, no vote has been called or taken because- We are I'm about to move forward with taking a vote. Ms. Fass, if you could take a roll call vote of the assembly, please. Right, Ms. Causey. I'm not voting. Mr. Offerman. Yes. Mr. Thomas. Yes. Ms. Scott. Yes. Three in favor. Thank you. So we will discuss um, 
8350 at the next PRC meeting, excuse me, PRC meeting. Um, so now we're moving on to our next item, which is the Public Works Operational Efficiency Review Report and Policy Recommendations. And for that, we call on Ms. Howie. Thank you, members of the committee. Are you able to see my screen? Yes. Yes. Thank you. Just want to review with you uh, again uh, the second part of uh, what staff have to present concerning the efficiency review. So I have three goals today. First, to discuss. I apologize. Um, on your uh, uh, display settings, can you switch your to duplicate uh, slideshow? There's no. There, there should be one at the top that says uh, switch uh, presenter. And there you go. Yes, ma'am. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, sir. So the second is to it's to discuss the actions that have been taken to date, and then um, to request of the committee your uh, questions and any recommendations for future actions. Uh, policy recommendations part two, there is a finding on page 134 about uh, the specifically the number of policies in human resources when compared with and um, the Public Works report uses districts. Um, there are there's no such thing in the state of Maryland. State of Maryland, we are systems. Um, so the comparison is with specifically Montgomery County and the indicating indicating that there were 45 policies there. Um, so the recommendation, the specific recommendation, is that the school system review uh, all human resources policies from other school systems and determine whether or not uh, we should add any policies to human resources. And that's a tier two recommendation. Recommendation 5-6 uh, is not unlike the prior recommendation, but here the request is for the Department of Physical Facilities to review its policies and to determine whether or not there are any policies uh, that should be implemented by the uh, Department of Physical Facilities. Recommendation 614 recommends a specific change to policy 3410, that there be a change from uh, a wording change from non-transportation to walk zone. Uh, this, as you note, is a tier three recommendation. And there is also, uh, oddly enough, um, recommended process. Uh, but here, as you see, uh, the process um, skips PRC and uh, PRC is and would be a part of any recommendation moving forward. Page 405, um, there is a reference to uh, data privacy and a specific recommendation. Um, it's recommendation 8-10 that the board establish, uh, the school system establish a board policy um, concerning data privacy and how individuals have access to data and which data in the school system uh, they should be given access to. Uh, there did not seem to be an awareness from Public Works that there is currently a board policy and superintendent's rule on data government gov governance. So we will be evaluating uh, whether or not amendments to this policy and rule respond directly to the finding. Recommendation 830 uh, asks that we incorporate hot links within both our instructional policies and other policies uh, so that individuals are led directly to information. And as you see, they recommend that the policy staff liaison and general counsel uh, meet with the company uh, that provides board doc services. Uh, recommendation 835 is that the uh, school system revise policy 6002 and that in that policy there be a directive to purchase curriculum uh, as opposed to having staff write curriculum. Policy, I'm sorry, recommendation 836 that there be a policy that requires uh, the school system to conduct annually a needs assessment and what specific schools, what individual schools require. So I've provided all that information in a table 
and I've also provided in this table tier one, tier two, and tier three. So even though these policies uh, are not yet before PRC, uh, if indeed staff go forward with the policy recommendations, there'll be a number of policies that will come before PRC this year and possibly next school year. So I wanted to provide as well to the committee um, uh, an update on our progress to date. Uh, there is a recommendation 1-11. As you're aware, we discussed this briefly last month uh, that uh, the board refine the superintendent's evaluation instrument and board policy 8501, which addresses the superintendent's evaluation is scheduled to be brought to the board or I'm sorry, brought to PRC next month. Uh, recommendation 1-3 is that the school system present and create a user-friendly subject word index. Um, board docs, I believe I mentioned this last month, but just wanted to make sure we were on the same page. Board docs does have a search feature and the staff has created step-by-step -step instructions to finding board policies and superintendents rule, rules. Um, that FAQ is posted on the website. As um, we were reviewing the website and reviewing whether or not um, our website was accessible and understandable to our public, one of the things we realized was that um, we, we lost the uh, public comment on policies page. So we've re-upped that page and this is what it looks like. Uh, so, the, so the public is now able to comment on policies through the website. And finally, um, we have tested the search feature in the policy manual uh, in board docs and those instructions, as I said, are included uh, in the FAQ. Uh, as you've seen, we've included references to the Public Works Report in our policy analyses. As I indicated, we drafted and placed explicit instructions on how to access board policies. It is a multi-step process. Um, as a result of the number of policies that may be coming to you, uh, staff is recommending that the committee consider an additional PRC meeting either in May or June to address those recommended policy changes, which are being asked specifically by, by Public Works for data governance, for CNI, and for human resources. And with that, I would ask if there are any further directions from PRC for action that you would like the committee to take, the staff to take, or if there are any directions you have for our December meeting. Thank you, Ms. Halley. We'll go around the room. Um, Ms. Causey. Thank you, Ms. Halley and staff for all of that work and for that presentation. Um, I did not see this document attached to board docs earlier. Um, was it, will it be attached to board docs? Yes, ma'am, we will. Okay. And was it sent in, in an email? It was not. Okay. What was uh, attached to board docs was the uh, the FAQ. Um, we had asked at the last uh, PRC meeting that um, uh, you solicit your publics uh, and your constituencies for any suggestions to um, ease of reference and access to the uh, the website uh, to the policy website. So we do look forward to receiving those recommendations which is why we sent you uh, what has been posted. We did not receive any input or have not received it as of yet. So I think it would be helpful for, um, as Public Works recommended, is to have hot links so that um, staff board members and, and constituents would not have to take, you know, eight different selections to get to, this, to the, policies that are on board docs and then to have a separate um, hot link for superintendent's rules because we had um, it had been discussed that um, and it's the board docs software it's not Baltimore County Public Schools software um, where the rules and the policies are 
you know, in the same short little um, drop down box. So, so that would be um, a suggestion I had. Um, going back to the um, recommendation or the information that you presented, mm -hmm. um, is it possible to go to the page that had the um, listed the the tier one and the tier two? Sure. Thank you. You're welcome. Um, yes, I would just uh, think that it would be important to um, add the two tier one uh, policies um, to a, a fairly um, near uh, policy review committee meeting since they are labeled tier one. Also, I would point out that a uh, board member um, had put in a request for um, at the November meeting to have a review of the ransomware attack and its impacts and the um, improvements and updates that have been made. Um, and I think it would be important to have as a part of that review um, to understand how the board's policies were uh, implemented throughout that ransomware attack response. So the data governance po policy, for instance, has a um, uh, that there should be a an emergency plan. I'm paraphrasing because I don't have it in front of me. Um, so I think that that would be helpful as well. Um, and I'm not sure how that request needs to be made, a motion or just a Madam Chair request of Ms. Howie to um, uh, make that request to have that discussion with the superintendent. Um, so I, that would be my, those would be my inputs. Thank you, ma'am. And as I indicated, as far as staff's recommendations are concerned to add another meeting to the end of your year, towards the end of the year, the reason that I'm requesting that it be in May or June is that that will provide staff sufficient time to get the work done. I cannot promise that the work will be done based on the, um, the multiple uh, strands of projects that are going on at this point to implement some of what or most of what Public Works has recommended. So I know that we can get it done by May. I don't know that we can get it done sooner and have it done with the standards that are expected of BCPS employees. Thank you for that, because I know especially policy 6002 would require um, collaboration with the Department of Curriculum and Instruction as well as procurement. Um, so I can certainly understand that. So um, I appreciate that and I'll um, leave that up to you and the um, Chair and Vice Chair of PRC to coordinate the agenda. But I would be open to uh, another meeting in uh, May or June. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Alferman. Yes, my, uh, one of my main concerns, or perhaps my main concern in the discussion, is uh, the comments made by the people who, who, who are doing the evaluation about the number of policies we have in, in, terms, of, uh, in terms of human resources. Uh, I'd like staff to explore whether whether that has any real meaning because I I I I'd like to say I'm I, I guess I'm interested in, in what 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 is what, what is the content different between other counties human uh, human uh, human resource policy than ours? But purely a, a number count doesn't really mean much to me. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Okay. Uh, next, um, Mr. Thomas. Thank you. Uh, I am open to another PRC meeting in uh, May or or June or the suggested months. That that's how we had. Um, but other than that, there are, are no other suggestions for me. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Thomas. Um, and for me, I, I, I don't have any suggestions. I feel you all are very thorough um, and I too am open to another meeting in May or June. Thank you. Thank you. OK, so now let's see. Where we are with that and. OK, so now it looks like the floor is open uh, to members of the committee to discuss issues of concern. 
Um, I must emphasize that this is not the time to conduct business as there has not been notice provided as required by the Open Meetings Act. So are there any issues of concern? And I'll just go around and call on each member's name. Um, Ms. Causey? Thank you. So um, one, one issue that's a, a, um, a board internal operational issue um, is around legal counsel, which we didn't get to because of calling orders of the day, but that can be discussed in another meeting, is operationally how is the uh, board legal counsel used? There was some questions um, in the previous months around board members requesting to have um, legal counsel uh, around different issues and just to operationally understand um, the full board to understand how that's done, whether it's a formal request to the chair and then there's a response that's provided or whether it's discussed in administrative function and there's a consensus or a vote reached by the board. Um, so I think that would be helpful to um, have some outline of that to discuss in a future meeting. Um, and that up to your discretion, Madam Chair, could be an administrative session of the full board. Um, and uh, I agree with additional training on parliamentary procedure, and I think it's helpful for um, the full board to receive training at the same time so that everyone's hearing the same message about whether it's parliamentary procedure or uh, budgeting or superintendent's evaluation. Um, so I would support um, efforts uh, in that regard. Um, and again, also board members understanding how operationally those decisions are made, whether it's for the full board in an administrative function um, to request, make a formal request for certain types of training and then receive approval or not. Um, and also um, related to public works recommendation to have user manuals more online. Um, I had requested over a year ago to uh, for the full board to receive the draft at the time of the operational procedures of the board office, uh, which had not been received. And um, I would request that the full board receive the operations manual for the board office, whether it's draft or um, finalized uh, for their review and understanding. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Thomas. Thank you. I do not have any at this time. Thank you. Thank you. And um, has Mr. Offerman, is he, Mr. Offerman still on the call? No, he's left, ma'am. Okay, thank you. Okay, and I don't have any concerns or anything to bring up at this time either. So um, thank you all for that. The next meeting of the Policy Review Committee is scheduled for December 13th, 2021 at 4.30 p.m. And because there is no further business, the meeting is adjourned. Thank you all very much. Thank you, committee members. Thank you. Hope everyone has a good evening. Thank you. Good night. Good night.